Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about etymology. Quelle surprise. <laughs> but even more so than usual, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> we're going to be talking about the etymology of etymology. Mm -hmm. We don't have very much to get to before that. Really just our cocktail. All right. So this, this will make sense in, in retrospect, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it made sense to me when we were looking it up. I now can't remember how I got to it, but we are having a cocktail known as a simple truth deferred guide recipe. It has rum and grapefruit juice and pineapple juice and honey syrup. And that was it. Oh, no. And Campari. So cheers. Cheers. Or as the rep recipe actually said, Red bitter Italian. Red Italian bitter yeah. liqueur. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Italian red liquor bitter. <laughs> no, I can't get this straight. This is it's... the adjective zone. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> Italian red bitter liqueur, I think. But they must have meant Kabari. Mm, that's real tasty, though. It's interesting. They call that the simple truth. And there were a bunch of other cocktail recipes, several different versions called the bitter truth. I feel like, you know, this has quite a lot of bitterness bitter, to it. Yeah. So maybe the simple truth is always bitter. It is bitter. the bitter truth. Huh? Ooh, starting off real deep. All right, Mark, explain why we're talking about etymology more. Why is this etymology podcast more special than every other etymology podcast, Mark? Well, it's our eldest son's fault. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'd forgotten that. <laughs> so I was, you know, we were trying to d discuss ideas, of pro I think, in a car trip to somewhere, mm -hmm. trying to come up with ideas about, you know, what to do for a podcast and mm, no, not a, a podcast for a video. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he said, well, why don't you do the etymology of the word etymology? <laughs> and I said, you're right. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> it must've been like what, 10 or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, years a, ago a while now. ago. Yeah. And, uh, and so you and did. So I did. <laughs> right. So today we're going to talk about the, having done it, the last episode was pure history and no etymology at all. This one was all etymology. <laughs> and then some. Yeah, we're going to get into the weeds a little bit. So we're going to listen to the video that came out of that conversation mm -hmm. and then talk even more in depth about the mechanics of etymology mm -hmm. and about some ancient and medieval etymologizers. So let's get going. Words have a past, and like all of us, they can change as they grow, so it's often important to consider their etymology or history. Words are, in a sense, the fossil remains of culture, the traces left behind by years of cultural change, so by examining these pot shards of language we gain insight into the history of culture by looking at what semantic frame has been connected to a given word throughout its history. However, we must remember that the meanings of words do change over time, and what a word means now is not necessarily determined by what it used to mean, as is the case for instance with the word decimated, which used to mean reduced by a tenth, but now is commonly used to mean reduced by a non-specific extreme amount. And yes, whatever the pedants say, literally can be meant figuratively and just be used as an intensifier. If we forget this and think that a word must always mean what its roots once meant, we are committing the etymological fallacy. Besides, what's really fascinating is the way words change over time. So the etym part of the word etymology comes from a Greek root meaning true, so etymology originally meant the study of the truth behind words, the logi part meaning the study of, from Greek logos meaning word, thought, or explanation. Greek etymos may be related to sooth, as in soothsayer, a teller of truths, and forsooth meaning, one might say, for reals. In fact, in classical and medieval times, scholars often believed that by finding the true roots and meanings of words they could learn about the true nature of reality, and even God's plan itself. Perhaps the most famous example of this was Isidore of Seville's great work The Etymologiae, which sought to explain the world by finding the true names of everything in it. Nowadays, of course, we use the term etymology to refer to the origins and history of words as opposed to their current meanings and uses. Actually, Isidore's Etymologiae is more than just a work of etymology. It's an encyclopedic collection of all the knowledge that Isidore, a 5th to 6th century bishop with feet planted both in the classical and medieval worlds, thought important. It's full of information about the classical world that would have been lost otherwise, and came to be a standard textbook of medieval education in the seven liberal arts, made up of the subjects of the trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. In fact, that's sort of what encyclopedia means. 
it comes from the Greek phrase in Kuklios Paideia, literally the circle of education, referring to the educational curriculum, and initially that's what the word meant in English too. And Kuklios comes from a root that means to revolve, and is related to the words cycle and wheel, and Paideia literally means child rearing, coming from Greek pais meaning child, and ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root meaning little or few. From this in the child sense we get words such as pediatrician, and in the education sense words such as pedagogy and pedant, a word too often connected with lovers of language. Isidore drew on other earlier encyclopedic general knowledge books like Pliny's Natural History, and there have since been other such works. However, one of the first modern encyclopedias as we would recognize it today was the Encyclopédie ou Dictionnaire raisonné des sciences, des arts et des métiers, compiled by Enlightenment thinker Denis Diderot. Today, of course, print encyclopedias have all but disappeared, largely replaced by online resources such as Wikipedia, from the Hawaiian word wiki meaning quick, so literally then a portmanteau meaning quick education. Fitting, no? So it is perhaps appropriate that Isidore Seville has been suggested as the patron saint of the internet. But getting back to etymology, while we often trace words back to their immediate source before coming into modern English, such as Old English, French, Latin, or Greek, we can sometimes go back to English's most distant traceable ancestor, Proto-Indo-European. So it's time for a word about that. Languages are like families, with parent, child, and cousin languages. English, for instance, is one member of the Indo-European family of languages, and counts among its relatives languages such as Latin, French, German, Greek, and Hindi, and a long list of others. The ultimate parent of all these languages is thus said to be Proto-Indo-European, a hypothetical reconstructed language. That's what a proto-language is, a hypothetical reconstructed language from which other known languages descend, from Greek proton meaning first, so Proto-Indo-European is the first Indo-European language. And for completeness, Indo and India come through Latin, Greek, and Persian from a Sanskrit word meaning river, possibly from an Indo-European root which means to drive or go away and European and Europe come from a figure in Greek myth named Europa, who was ravished by the god Zeus. But the name is of uncertain ultimate origin, possibly meaning broad face from Eurus meaning wide and Ops meaning literally eye, or ironically possibly from a non-Indo-European source, such as Akkadian Arabu to go down or set as in sunset, or Phoenician Arab meaning evening, either way suggesting the west. We don't know for sure when or where the original speakers of Proto-Indo-European lived, but it was probably in or before the 4th millennium BCE. One theory, called the Kurgan Hypothesis, is that they lived in the steppe land north of the Black Sea, the Caucasus Mountains, and the Caspian Sea, where the horse was first domesticated, and it was this technological advance which allowed them to herd more efficiently and expand into new areas. Another theory, the Anatolian hypothesis, is that they originally lived in the area around modern day Turkey, and instead were an agricultural society. Either way, these original Indo-Europeans did spread into new areas bringing their culture, and most importantly for our purposes, their language with them. When we talk about reconstructing proto-languages like Proto-Indo-European or Proto-Germanic, it's like doing genealogical research to find a long lost ancestor, only without any actual physical evidence. Proto-languages existed in a time before writing was available, so no written record survives, but by looking at a number of child languages that we believe are related we can make some good guesses as to what their parent must have been like. So English father corresponds to Latin pater, Greek pater, and Sanskrit peter, and we can therefore posit the Proto-Indo-European pater, the asterisk written in front of it means it's a hypothetical reconstructed form. Nor is it just a question of finding a number of similar sounding words with similar meanings in a number of different languages. After all, words can travel or be snatched directly from one language to another, so that's not enough proof. Furthermore, words from different languages might be coincidentally similar. Therefore historical linguists look for regular, systematic, and predictable correspondences between sounds in those sets of similar words. So for instance, the Germanic F in English words such as father, foot, and fish corresponds predictably with P in other Indo-European languages, such as Latin pater, pes pedis, and piscis, and also with Greek pater and pus podos for that matter. This is particularly noticeable in English. Originally a Germanic language, over time it borrowed many words from other Indo-European languages, such as from Latin because that was the language of the church and of scholarship during the Middle Ages and Renaissance, from French because of the Norman conquest in 1066, and from Greek because it was often used as the language of scientific terminology after the rediscovery of the writings of the ancient Greeks. 
So English ended up with sets of related words, such as star and astrology, or fatherhood and paternity, which linguists call cognates, sort of like cousins, cognatus means born together or related by birth in Latin. And knowing this tells you that hemp comes from the same plant as cannabis, sends your hound to a kennel, or gets you doing your cardio exercise to improve the health of your heart. The last set of examples gives you another sound correspondence, Germanic H for Latin or Greek C or K. These particular correspondences between certain consonants in Germanic languages and other Indo-European languages to follow yet another strand in the etymological web is called Grimm's Law, after Jakob Grimm. Yes, that Jakob Grimm, of the Brothers Grimm. In addition to collecting folk tales, Grimm was one of the early pioneers in the field of comparative philology, comparing different languages to work out which ones were related and how. Basically, Grimm's Law describes a sound change that happened to Proto-Indo-European consonants as they passed into Proto-Germanic. So the voiceless stops in Proto-Indo-European became the voiceless fricatives in Proto-Germanic, that is p, t, k, and qu became f, th, ch, and ch, with ch and ch eventually becoming h and hu. The voiced stops b, d, g, and gu lost their voicing, that is the vibration of the vocal cords, and filled the gap left by the voiceless stops becoming p, t, k, and qu. The voiced aspirated stops lost their aspiration, a little extra breath of air, and became those regular unaspirated voiced stops. The word philology, by the way, referring to historical linguistics, or more broadly the study of language in written texts, literally means love of words, which I suppose you must have, as I do, if you're interested in knowing how all these sound changes work. By the way, Grimm wasn't exactly the first to come up with the idea. Friedrich Schlegel was the first to note the PF correspondence, and Rasmus Rask suggested further sound correspondences, but since Grimm was the first to clearly explain the idea as a regular sound change, at least initially crediting Rask, we now generally refer to this as Grimm's Law, though some people have suggested Rask's Rule as an alternate name. However, it was really one of Grimm's predecessors who kicked the whole thing off. In a way, we have trade monopolies in British imperialism to thank for his discovery. During the time of the great European empires from the 17th through 19th centuries, many countries set up what became known as East India Companies, with trade monopolies in the East. Britain's East India Company eventually came to have so much power and control in India that it became a kind of quasi-government, with its own currency, armed forces, and legal system. Eventually the British government decided it would be a good idea to take more of an active interest in the activities of the company, and appointed a Governor General in Bengal, one Warren Hastings, who by the way was an admirer of our encyclopedist Denis Diderot and read his writings on the way to India. Hastings also became a big fan of India's ancient culture and texts, and it became policy to run the administration and legal system in the area based on existing customs. Problem was, the ancient laws were written in the equally ancient language Sanskrit, so British judges had to rely on local knowledge, which they didn't entirely trust. They were dependent on the interpretation of the Pandits, scholars of Sanskrit, that's where we get the word pundit, and fittingly too given the potential for mistrust in both the original and contemporary senses of the word. It was into this situation that language genius William Jones arrived. Jones already had a reputation as a gifted philologist, with knowledge of dozens of languages, and after receiving a judicial appointment in Bengal he took up the study of Sanskrit in order to translate those legal codes, and in his spare time founded the Asiatic Society with Hastings to pursue serious linguistic studies. And though there were others who had noticed similarities between languages and suggested relationships, Jones was the first to really formulate the idea of a proto-language from which many other languages descend, what we now call Proto-Indo-European. Jones's interest in Indo-European comparative philology kicked off a whole cottage industry in comparative studies in Indo-European and other cultures, such as comparative mythology and folklore, which included Grimm's other great work, the collection of folk tales and fairy tales he compiled with his brother Wilhelm. That same father example from before gives us a clue as to how this works. Many Indo-European cultures seem to have had sky father gods, so we can posit Proto-Indo-European Dieu Pater, as meaning literally Shining Father, which becomes Jupiter in Latin. Dieu also leads to Jove, another name for Jupiter, Deus, the Latin word for God, the Greek god Zeus, and the Germanic god Tyr in Old Norse and Tiu in Old English, who is the namesake of Tuesday. So we started by digging up the past to try to find the ancestral truth about language by looking at its fossils. What we found was that, like all living things, language evolves, changes over time. 
And so, while we fill in the family portraits of our genealogy, we also have the fun of looking forward to snapshots of the next generations of our ever-evolving English language. So I want to say a little bit more about, you know, all this stuff about Grimm's Law and comparative linguistics and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I will say some of that's a little hard to follow in the way it was helpful in the video to have visuals. Yes. So if you found that a little hard to follow, do feel free to go watch the etymology video and see all those sounds and the sound changes. Mm -hmm. So let me further explain or, or clarify, let's say, some of these terms that I've been throwing around there. Mm -hmm. So I talk about stops. Stops are consonants, consonant sounds, in which you completely stop the airflow and then suddenly release it again. Mm -hmm. And so that includes sounds like t and d and p and k, mm -hmm. right? Where you have this kind of a little explosion of air. Voicing is all about vibrating the vocal cords. So some of these stops you can make without vibrating your, your vocal cords. So if you place your fingers just on your throat. Mm, he's, he's giving very good visuals here. Yeah. So, you know, you, you should do it too. <laughs> place your fingers on your throat and then make a sound like the P sound or T sound. You feel no vibration in your vocal cords. Mm -hmm. But then if you make the B sound or D sound, B, B, D, D, you feel that little bit of vibration. Mm -hmm. So unvoiced and voiced. Right. Fricatives are consonant sounds that are produced the most rude. when you make, well, literally friction with the air. So mm -hmm. you partially block the air coming out of your mouth mm -hmm. so that on its way out, it has to kind of rush past these small openings that you've left for it and makes a kind of noisy sound. sound. Yeah. yeah. So that includes sounds like f, the F sound, right? Mm -hmm. Or th, the TH sound. <laughs> Or you're, s you're making great faces. Sound, right? <laughs> yeah. And so both stops and fricatives can be voiced and unvoiced. So you've mm -hmm. got voiced and unvoiced stops, voiced and unvoiced fricatives. So v or f. Yeah. Voiced, unvoiced. Yeah. So you, you make the, the V sound and the F sound the exact, your mouth is in the exact same position with your teeth pressed against your lip and you push air through that partially constricted passage. And depending on whether or not you also vibrate your vocal cords at the same time, decides whether it's voiced or unvoiced. And then the aspiration that, as I said, is this little puff of air. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in English, I mean, we have, we do have these variations on stops. We have aspirated stops and unaspirated stops, but they never make the distinction between one word and another. Yeah, I was just going to say aspiration is one of the ones that's hardest for English speakers mm -hmm. to really hear or distinguish because it doesn't make a semantic difference. Or yeah, it's automatic. Know, semantic, it's never the minimal pair. Yeah, it's never you, can't, the thing that yeah you can't make a minimal pair, but you can get the feeling for it if you Hold, so again, I'm describing what I'm doing here. I'm going to hold my, my hand in front of my mouth, fairly close to it. I'm just going to block the microphone a little bit, but, <laughs> and then you say the word pit and spit, pit, pit and spit. spit. You'll notice when you make, when you say pit, there's more air coming through you and you feel you the air. Feel the fingers, air. Yeah. Whereas when you say spit, you don't really feel that little puff of air. So the rule in English is that if the stop is the initial sound, then it gets aspirated. Mm -hmm. But if it's in a consonant cluster, for instance, with an S coming before it, consonant cluster in which it's not the first sound, I guess. So if you've got a consonant cluster in which there is a sound that comes before the stop, then it's not aspirated. Right. Like spit. But in other words, it, what English doesn't have is one word pit and another word I, I can't even do it because mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm, it's not important in English, so I don't know how to do it, but pit, bit, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, that doesn't have an aspiration no. where one means something and the other means something else. Unlike yeah. there are many languages where whether it's an aspirated D or an unaspirated D or what, how much can of an aspirated D. Can distinguish between two different words. That are yeah. otherwise homonyms. And that can be very hard. That's one of these things that it's hard for English speakers to hear the difference. And yeah. I'm thinking of Tamil specifically. Right. Because this is has, like your dad's, the name mm -hmm. for your dad in Tamil, name for grandfather in Tamil, Tata. 
Mm -hmm. I don't say right. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be an aspirated. Or a se semi, like the, it, there was like three or four D, D mm. and TH sounds or D and T sounds in several Indian languages. I remember in Sanskrit, there were a number when I was looking at it and I, I can't do it. I can't, I can understand the logistics of it. I can, mm -hmm. I can go through the mechanics of it, but I can't pronounce or hear it. Mm -hmm. But for English speakers, you do make a difference. You, you can find minimal pairs with mm -hmm. voiced and unvoiced. So like pear and bear or bit and pit. And in Old English, it was only partially a, a distinction between V and F. Mm -hmm. So in fact, the writing system didn't have V. Mm -hmm. It was always spelled with F. And you'd know how to pronounce it based on the phonetic what other, what else was um, around it? Yeah. Context. And that gets sort of fossilized into modern English with words like wolf and wolves. Mm -hmm. So we spell, we now spell that as, you know, with an F or a V, mm -hmm. but in old English, you would always use the F and you'd know which way to pronounce it depending on whether it was singular or plural. And also the, the one that always, I think works really well to show that is fox and vixen. Yes, because there it's an initial We don't think sound. of those as being similar words because the F and the V are distinctive enough now to us to matter, but it's the same word, fox mm -hmm. and vixen. It's just because one of them is an unstressed and one is stressed or whatever. I don't know what mm -hmm. it is that makes the difference between why one is voiced and one is unvoiced. And the other, the other good example of that is off and of, right? right? right. We, we spell it with one F, but we pronounce it like it's a V. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This all, of course, leads back to the spelling Yes. question of like, why does English spelling not ma match English pronunciation? It's things like this that, yeah. that tend to cause that. Yeah. So these are these kinds of distinctions we can use to classify groups of consonants mm -hmm. into these different groups. And what Grimm's law describes is a kind of a shift in, in which one whole group gets shifted to another position. Mm -hmm. So you should talk about positions. Yeah. So what, when you talked about stops, you gave a whole bunch of lists of examples of stops mm -hmm. and the thing, they were all stops. So what distinguished them? What distinguished them is what part of your mouth you were using to stop the air. Yeah. So within each group, there are several different positions where you put your mouth parts, right? Mm -hmm. So P is putting two lips together. T is putting your tongue just well, behind your teeth. So what happened, what Grimm's law does is it explains a sound change in which a whole set of consonant sounds shifts as kind of as a group to a different manner of articulation. Mm -hmm. So the stops, the unvoiced stops, those stops become fricatives. You keep the same place of articulation, right? So the T and TH sound you're, you're still making those sounds this basically the same way with your tongue near the teeth, but you're changing the manner of articulation from a stop to a fricative. So like you're opening your mouth a little bit more so that the mm -hmm. air goes through rather than stop. So t, t, th, th, yeah, it's, yeah. th is a really hard one to pronounce on a podcast. It can't extend a th, <laughs> it just doesn't work. And so what we don't know though, about this whole sort of shifting of groups from kind of one manner of articulation to another is whether it's a pull chain or a push chain. In other words, did one group of sounds sort of vacate a slot basically? Mm -hmm. And so a bunch of other sounds then rushed in to take up that slot, or do you have a situation in which one set of sounds moves to another slot, pushing out the ones that were already there. So they have to become something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And we don't know if it's a pull chain or a push no, because chain. there's what, no way to reconstruct that really. What we see is it's very hard to see the sort of middle moment, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, especially when you're talking about a sound change that happens before writing. Before writing. Yes. No, the ones that we have writing for without a fixed spelling system, because for instance, it's much harder to track it in writing mm -hmm. now, if you talk about like, I don't know, a London accent turning on, you know, THs into Fs, people don't write that down. Yeah. Very, very rarely do you actually write down what it looks like. You have, I mean, now we can record sounds and everything, but you know, things, even after writing, in other words, yeah. it becomes hard Though to trace some of them. Spelling the, can be a useful indication, especially before that's, standardized That's what spelling. I was, that's yeah. what I was just saying though. It's a, yeah, that, that period of time when there's not standardized spelling is great yeah. because there's, but then once you get standardized spelling, it stops being very useful for tracking yeah. those changes anymore because we just change the way we say it, but we don't mm -hmm. change the way we spell it. 
Though surprisingly, a sound change that happened at a time when you think it would be easy to track, the great vowel shift, mm -hmm. we don't know if that's a pull chain or a push chain either. Mm -hmm. It's the same situation where you get, you Well, know, the problem is we were standardizing spellings right around that. Right around that, so yeah. It yeah. We can see it it's, happening in the spelling, but... It's tricky. It's, it's hard to know exactly why it happens. Yeah. yeah. The thing also that I just want to stress, and maybe we're going to stress this too, but when you're talking about these laws like Grimm's law or whatever, it's not just that every P becomes an F. It's not every single stop becomes a fricative or something like that, right? But the point is that, for instance, initial stops become, so it, it has to do with the context. It's not that that sound in every single place in one language turns into a different sound in every single place in another language. I suppose that can happen, theoretically could happen, but these laws are really describing, it's more, it's more specific yeah, than that, so right? Yeah, so it it's can about... be context dependent. Mm -hmm. And so that lead, leads me to my next point, yeah. which is that there are exceptions, mm -hmm. right? Where you would expect Grimm's law to make a certain consonant change a certain way, and yet it doesn't happen or it doesn't have until, that change. It may until, have a different yeah, change. Until you kind of look, there, there, are, there are exceptions, so but there are rules there to are explain There are rules it. in terms of the context. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the example of the word father. We would expect from the Proto-Indo-European pater to get the old English form father with a th sound in the middle, right. right? So the p becomes an f as we saw. An initial p. An initial p becomes an initial f. And the t in the middle should become a fricative as well. It should become a th sound. But in Old English, it's spelled fader with a mm. d. Mm -hmm. So that seems to break the rule. Now, of course, you may be thinking, but it does eventually become a th. Mm -hmm. And it does, that is true, but it does that later. And that is in accord with a later sound shift that happens that we can see in other words. So basically the rule is, and this is a sound change that happens around 1400. What you see is that medial th, mm -hmm. when it's in the middle of a word between two vowels, mm -hmm. we see this change of post vocalic. So after a vowel, the D becomes a th sound, a voiced th sound, mm -hmm. right? The, the yeah. right? If it comes before syllabic R or er, the er sound, like the ER. Okay, that right. sort of schwa or with an R. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we can see that regular sound change in words like mother, Old English moder, modern English mother, or hither, from hither, okay. the D, to hither. Or another example would be weather. That used to be a D becomes okay. a TH. So that's a regular sound change that we can see in a bunch of words when you get that. Wow. And that's what happened to father. And that's why it doesn't happen until 1400 or now, so. But why didn't it, why didn't it turn initially go? So why didn't it initially become father? Well, that is because, and, and this isn't a random thing. Mm -hmm. That's right? the point, right? Random changes. I mean, obviously a very occasionally random changes are going to happen, but random changes tell us that we're not getting it right. Mm -hmm. We haven't, we haven't figured out the pattern and we haven't figured out the etymology correctly. There's another stage or this word isn't really from the thing we think it's from. If it's random, mm -hmm. it's not right. So it, it comes down to, or it came down to a Danish philologist named Carl Werner to spot the regular pattern here. And it basically has to do with stress patterns in Proto-Indo-European. So if that voiceless stop was at the start of the first syllable of a word, or if it was immediately preceded by the stressed syllable of a word, it followed Grimm's Law as you would expect. But if the syllable before that voiceless stop sound was unstressed in Proto-Indo-European, the stop instead just becomes voiced, doesn't so become a fricative. To d. d. Yeah. And so pater, the first syllable was unstressed and the stress falls on the second syllable there. And what happens that sort of goes along with this is in all of the Germanic vocabulary, the stress pattern shifts to always having the stress on the first syllable mm -hmm. in polysyllabic but that's a words. later, But that's a later process. Yeah. So pater Becomes. gives us fader at some point, which is why- Oh, at why, some point, At fader, some point, yeah. there, was, there must have been an intermediate stage, yeah. is what you're saying, where it was fader. Fader. And that's why it's stated D yeah. rather than- It goes from why, a T it goes to from a, a T to a D rather yeah. than T to a TH. Yeah. But then the whole, the, the language of the shifts, whole switch, switches it. So you can no longer see thing. that stress pattern. Right. So now it's fader. Yeah. 
but the D is still there because that stress change doesn't change the consonant. Yeah. And then later, there's a consonantal shift where you get the Ds turning into THs in certain contexts. Yeah. So even though it ends up looking the same mm -hmm. as if it had gone straight from pater to mm -hmm. father, yeah. it doesn't because no. it wasn't that. Which, and this yeah. is one of the difficulties with working through all these sound changes is they all happen chronologically in, in a certain order, right? right. A certain right. sound change happens at a certain time, and that could be either earlier or later relative to another sound change. Mm -hmm. So you have to apply the sound changes in the right order to get the right form Final, at the end. Yeah. And also to tell you what's similar to another language at any stage or mm -hmm. whether it was borrowed in at this stage or at that stage and things like that. Yeah. And I remember as a graduate student having to, to learn this relative order, you know, we were applying the various sound changes to work away from Proto-Germanic to Old English. And so, for instance, with the A sound, various changes happen to that Proto-Germanic A sound, like fronting, it becomes an ah sound and breaking, it becomes an ah sound. But also there was the restoration of the ah sound if there was a back vowel in the next syllable. And so you had to know what order all these sound changes happen in to produce the right final form to show how it changed from the proto-language to the later form. And the key here is you learned that as a grad student because it had all been worked out. Yes. Scientific etymology or the development of this kind of etymology worked the other way. Yeah. It worked from a modern word or from later example of, you know, a recorded word mm -hmm. back. But the whole point of all these laws is if you try to do this with only one word, there is no, like, that isn't evidence. That doesn't. No, you've you got to show it, it as a systematic bunches of words and what they do Hunter, and you say, yeah. okay, well, these words went back. And so you take it as far back as you can with written sources. Yeah. And then you have to do the thing. That's where the comparative philology comes in, right? Yeah. So what you do is you look for a pattern and it, it's like, you know, the scientific method, right? You come up with a hypothesis that says, well, this sound should become this sound in, in, these, in these contexts, contexts yeah. and in these orders and so forth. And then you say, okay, well, let me try and reproduce that with another word with that same sound. And if it produces the right form, then you can say, ah, okay, that's more evidence. No, to but show what, when you true. say right form, how are you checking that? The right final form. No, but right how are you checking form. that? So what you're doing is you're comparing two languages that have a presumed yes, common answer. Well, that's so you're looking at two words that are attested in a later language. Mm -hmm. Well, actually it's not, you don't just work with two, you try and collect a whole bunch of words. That follow a similar sound pattern. That follow way. a sim yeah. similar sound pattern. And in fact, you look for a whole bunch of different languages that all come from a, the same Well, but you're trying to figure language. this out. You don't know about the proto-language yet. No, that you suspect. Yeah. You get a bunch of languages yeah. that you say, oh, these are kind of similar. Okay, let's see if we can find yeah. a pattern. Yeah a regular pattern. And then you, you look at what bits are common between several of them and say, well, three of these languages have the same thing in this context. This one has something different in this context. So we can go with the hypothesis that the one that the three languages have is the earlier form, the more original form, and something happened to that fourth one that fourth language. And then you see if that you, plays you out in other come up words with a, across a hypothesis that, yeah. and you try it out and you try it out and you yeah. try it out and you try it out. Yeah. So this is why this was done in the 19th century yeah. by people with a lot of money and nothing else to do because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a very, I mean, obviously now you can use computers and things, but it's, it's a long laborious process mm -hmm. even so. And it, it's kind of amazing to think of how much work it took yeah. to figure this stuff out in the time before computers. <laughs> what is a refinement of Grimm's law or this exception to Grimm's law becomes known as Werner's law because right. he figured it he out. Figured yeah. it out. So all of this, you know, I'm arguing in favor of, of looking at language as a kind of family structure where mm -hmm. you've got, as I said, parents, parents and, daughters and, and cousins. daughters and cousins and so forth. Or the other way is if you look at the actual video, you see how I visually represent all of these things as a kind of tree diagram mm -hmm. with things branching off, right? So there's this tree metaphor. It's called the tree model, in fact, in, in linguistics. And so this is kind of the central model that historical linguistics has used for, well, ever since William Jones. Mm -hmm. But there are some problems if we look really closely mm -hmm. uh, at this, there's some problems with this metaphor that can lead us astray. So it was the 19th century linguist, August Schleicher, 
who was the first to actually propose the tree model in that particular metaphor. Mm -hmm. And, and the idea of thinking of language as sort of evolutionary. Right. And he claimed to have come to his ideas about the evolution of languages after he heard of Darwin's ideas, but whether or not he was influenced by Darwin or not, he certainly begins to arrange languages in these genealogical trees inspired by the, the Darwinian mm -hmm. phylogenic trees to show that same kind of evolutionary mm -hmm. process. And the, the important thing to notice about this, think of it in, in this evolutionary way is you get divergences. Right. That's all you get, right? One thing can split into two. Right. And then could split into more and split into more, right? That's the only action that is available to you if you're thinking in terms of this tree model. Right, right. So Schleicher, by the way, was also the first to attempt to use this evolutionary idea of language to kind of roll back the clock and reconstruct a text in Proto-Indo-European. Hmm. And this is known as Schleicher's fable. Oh yes, I've heard about this. It uses sort of the basic words the that ones are, that he could most securely sort of reconstruct, yeah. that he or objects and, mm -hmm. and basic verbs. And it's, it's fairly short. I, I'll read it. I can read out a translation of it. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce well, either his of, reconstruction right. of the phonology or later, because right. I'm not, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in Proto-Indo-European per se, but it's called the sheep and the horses. So this is a, an English translation. Not all of these words are necessarily the descendant words of the Proto-Indo-European right. words because they shift in meaning often. So you can't Yeah, we really could probably it. come back to that, that question of semantics too, mm -hmm. but yeah. So a sheep that had no wool saw horses, one of them pulling a heavy wagon, one carrying a big load and one carrying a man quickly. The sheep said to the horses, my heart pains me seeing a man driving horses. The horses said, listen, sheep, our hearts pain us when we see this. A man, the master, makes the wool of the sheep into a warm garment for himself, and the sheep has no wool. Having heard this, the sheep fled into the plain. <laughs> it's a nice little story. It's a nice yeah. little, you know. So he, he does a good job of constructing an actual story, an actual story that has a message and all of that. So it could be this little, you know, mm -hmm. aphorism or, or what's the word? Fable. Um, fable. Yeah, yeah, fable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the idea there is those are words that appear in enough languages in stable enough forms that mm -hmm. you can definitely or as close to definitely as possible. And that's, of course, part of what when people start talking about the Indo-Europeans as a culture. Mm -hmm. They make suppositions based on what words can be traced back to them to say things like they had horses and sheep yeah. and wagons. Those are all yeah. specific cultural markers that are not true of every single culture. So that gives you indications about their culture. So for instance, the word for sheep is awis. Mm -hmm. In his reconstructed form of it was awis. But of course, people have refined the phonetics of Proto-Indo-European since then. So, but they're all basically that kind of sound, mm -hmm. awis, which is, you know, clearly recognizable in Latin anyways. Mm -hmm. It's not the same word in English, but... Ovis. Yeah, ovis. Ovis. So that's the other thing that Schleicher is known for. Now, as I say, it turns out that this... Now, it turns out that this tree model doesn't tell the whole story of language development as it doesn't account for things like lateral transmission due to borrowing from one language to another or any other kind of language contact, mm -hmm. and the fact that languages don't always develop from single isolated dialects, but from a range of dialects present at the same time, right? It's not one parent, one child. You can have, in a sense, a whole bunch of dialects that then lead to a whole bunch of dialects in very complicated mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. So you need incestuous branches. Yeah. So this is the, <laughs> this is the flaw with thinking of it as a tree because it doesn't allow for mm -hmm. this kind of co complexity. So languages aren't distinct abstractions, right? When we say the English language, what we mean is a whole bunch of speech communities that use a fairly similar language, right? Can, can communicate with one another. Can communicate yeah. with one another. And so, conceive of themselves as having the same language. Yes. So we have to think more in terms of speech communities of numerous people who have cohesion for various, you know, social or political or whatever reasons, reasons. but are nevertheless individual people. 
And sometimes languages diverge into distinct dialects divided by geography. So you have one group that splits off and one group maybe settles on uh, or stays where they were and the other group goes over a difficult mountain and settles over there. And so they're divided geographically or they mm -hmm. sail to an island or something like that right. so that they're, they're isolated they're from each from other. other. Yeah. yeah. And then they they therefore diverge. Mm -hmm. Okay. That sometimes happens, but often that is not the case, right? Mm -hmm. They are still geographically within reach of each other and still have contact with each other. Right. So while they do diverge, they still can share things back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so now linguists tend to talk in terms of dialect continuums so that, you know, one group that's relatively close geographically to a neighboring group may be mutually intelligible to each other. But if you go several groups down, I mean, each one will, will maybe be able to communicate with the one that's closest to them. But if you look at the two furthest away ones, they may have difficulty. So it's, it's a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. All, a lot of this is obscured now. These kind of things are obscured now because we have, first of all, more rigid borders and we also have communication that you transcends, know, those transcends geography. Well, and so. we have, and we have art artificial things like national language policies yeah. and religious choices that make people choose particular languages over other languages, you know, like a whole bunch of, uh, a lot of different factors go into what languages people speak and how they work to maintain or change or whatever. Yeah. Furthermore, divergence and dissent is not the only way that linguistic features can be transmitted. So as we said, there could be borrowing, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing that we often talk about, you know, we refer to it with this, this German word Sprachbund. Do we? <laughs> well, <laughs> some people do. <laughs> some people do, which are linguistic regions that can have an aerial feature. That's aerial as in area, the adjective version of area. Okay. That's the word that linguists use, aerial features. See, who put linguists in charge of making up words? Because <laughs> that was a big mistake. <laughs> These are features that can be shared by a number of different languages, including ones that aren't even related. So you could have two languages that are, that are, don't come from the same language family, but they're in the same geographical region. And so certain linguistic innovations, like a new word can spread around in that area. Mm, okay. And we talk about that as an aerial feature. Right. Like a vocabulary. Like I a vocabulary. Yeah. But it can also happen with non-vocabulary things to like pronunciations and hmm. various other okay. things. So it is possible. The vocabulary is the most common right. kind, but it can be other things. And the, of course, the other problem is, you know, because of this sort of reference to the, the evolutionary side mm -hmm. of things is that biological species do not crossbreed, right? That's the definition of a species. As of a species, right? So you come to the sort of conclusion that, oh, language can't either, but there's no reason that, right, so you, true, yeah. you may miss things mm -hmm. if you're thinking rigidly along those lines. And so language can have lateral transfer, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, lateral transfer is, turns out, is pretty common in language. Mm -hmm. So again, that makes problematic the the notion and english is a very good example of pretty much all of these things yeah, right a whole lot of <laughs> like, vocabulary that was lateral how transfer. if you try to do english just as a branch yeah. of a, a, a single branching tree you can only trace it back to german and you to germanic and that is just a false understanding of english mm -hmm. so you then can't figure out where most of the words in english come from because they don't follow that trace yeah so as a result a student of schleicher named Johannes Schmidt proposed a different model. And whether you think it's a complete replacement or a refinement or an extra thing, you know, different people have thought different things about this over, over the years. But in any case, he, he suggested thinking of it more like waves. So this is the wave model. Okay. So think of dropping a pebble in water and it's spreading out in these concentric circles. That was the sort of model that mm -hmm. he was saying that language could change that way. Now, as it turns out, I mean, what most modern linguists would say is that's one possible way it can happen, but it, it's not the only way either. Right. So it can't be a complete replacement of the tree model. 
But nevertheless, thinking of it in terms of these concentric waves is important. And so what you get is, yeah, a linguistic innovation can happen in one place and then spread out having a smaller and smaller effect the further you get away. And then you could theoretically set up like interference happened. patterns, right? Interference. You could have yeah. you could have multiple originating languages, which mm -hmm. the waves then cross over one another. Yeah. And so produce language, yeah. language A and language B could each have their individual, so you know, linguistic innovations and both of those can influence language C. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the wave model. More recently, another way of thinking about it is in terms of linkages. And I like this, this model. You would. <laughs> yes. So it's thinking of dialects as a kind of network. Mm -hmm. So you have a network of related dialects or languages, however, and linguists, you know, actually don't like using the word dialect because there's no definition for it. As if there's a definition for the word language. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> not, not as distinct from the word dialect. Yeah. So there's a field called dialectology, but it refuses to define the word dialect, which is, you know, great naming. I told you, nobody should have put the <laughs> linguists in charge of making up words. It was a big mistake. So you have these, this comp complex network of related varieties, which kind of forms out of the gradual diffusion of a proto-language. Or rather, I suppose, you know, Definitely. rather than think of it as a proto language, think of it as a proto dialect continuum, because even <laughs> the proto language is not one variety that produces a bunch of things. It's a bunch of varieties that produce a bunch of other things in these very complicated network of influences. Yeah. The reason we go back to one proto language is because our ability to track that variety and those mm -hmm. distinctions disappears over time. Mm -hmm. So that by the time you're going back that far, you can really only reconstruct. Yeah. Uh, large level units, you can't go to the point of being able to reconstruct that. Yeah. That's why the, the trunk thickens in the other metaphor. So language innovations can be shared between neighboring dialects, even though they are diverging, mm. right? So it's not just a, you know, point of divergence and you've got two species, right? Mm -hmm. They still can continue to influence each other as they're overall kind of diverging, but certain linguistic innovations can still jump back and forth. Right, right. So, you know, simplicity is replaced by complexity, but we still use the tree model because it helps us wrap our head around, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on. And for sort on. of high level mm -hmm. understanding of language change, it gets you the basics, but yeah. Now, one way that we can look for this sort of evidence mm -hmm. and try and work out relationships between languages is using a list of vocabulary. And specifically, there was a list developed by Morris Swadesh, and so it's called the Swadesh List. He's a linguist <laughs> who, by the way, was a student of Edward Sapir, good mm -hmm. friend of the show. <laughs> Controversial figure. <laughs> And so what he did is he came up with a list of basically concepts that were thought to be like basic that you could find in all the languages, Okay. right? And therefore you could use this list for the purpose of cross-linguistic lexical comparison. Find the words that mean these things in language A and language B, and then compare them, compare the two lists. And then you can see, well, what's in common, what's not in common or whatever. Are there sounds that are similar? Yeah. yeah. Now, Swadesh used the list first to sort of study and classify the extent to which languages replaced basic words in their proto-language. So over time, languages change. So how, you know, what how words, fast. how fast, how many words get tossed out and replaced with something else. And then he used that information to try and estimate the age, <laughs> and I'm doing big scare quotes here, the age of languages, which is really to say the time since two languages diverge from a common ancestor. So it's all relative. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, kind of comparing two languages and trying to work out, okay, well, when, how long ago was this divergence right. between these two How long varieties? ago were these two languages the same language? Yeah. Now there's a bunch of assumptions, of course, being made there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, his Although the list, linguists still use the list, a lot of what he said about it is no longer held to be all that reliable. But there's this basic assumption that there is a basic rate at which these changes happen, right? And that's by no means clear that it's true. In fact, it, you know, it's not that hard to show that some languages can be more conservative and change less over a certain number of years as compared to another language. Right. 
I also feel like maybe you're going to talk about this. The base assumption there that there are certain words, you know, lexical items that are common to all languages. While I'm going to assume there are some fairly basic, you know, that we would all think, oh, common sense, that's true. The edges of a lexical, I mean, this is something we've talked about elsewhere, what any given lexical item actually encompasses and doesn't encompass, can't imagine there's any, yeah. like, even something as basic, like, I'm sure the words for relationships are on there, right? Mother, father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Mother and father seem like the most, ba how could every language not have a mother and father? There are languages where mother means every woman who is related to yeah. my mother. Every My mother and my aunts are all my yeah. mother. The all same word aunts, is used yeah. for all of those people. That doesn't mean that language doesn't have a word for mother. Of course it does. But the word, like, mm. to say that's the same as my word for mother, which only means one person, and I can't even mean a stepmother or, a, you know, or mother-in-law, that's not really the same word, is mm. it? Which is why a lot of linguists don't talk about the Swadesh list, but talk about the Swadesh lists, mm. because many people since have, you know, changed the list and refined the list and, you know, thrown I mean, out I can some totally words see the, and out I can words absolutely and, see the uh, usefulness of it. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say that you have to have something. You have to have some way of saying like what words, if I'm going to look at a new language, I can't look at the entire vocabulary right off the bat. Yeah. I have to do something to yeah. let to limit my my understanding of it to start off with. But but yeah, I just think Yeah, what you consider basic is is a tricky thing. I mean, you know, you can say certain things like, oh well, we're all biologically the same, so But that's we're like saying we all see the, the same color. I mean, we, ways, we've talked but... about this with color, right? Yeah. Like that's like saying we all see the same wavelengths, therefore our words for color must be the same, must mean the same wavelengths. But I mean, that's obviously, that's, it's, that's not true. Yeah. it's empirically not true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And whether you even think you see color is appearing, you know, quite a, leaving aside colorblind people and stuff like it's the same biology doesn't produce the same understanding of the world. I mean, there there certainly have been many challenges to the Swadesh list and how mm -hmm. we use it and is it even useful mm -hmm. and, and so forth. But but nevertheless, it's still, you know, it is a thing that linguists mm -hmm. have used some work, about, linguists yeah. work with. So, I mean, obviously there is a lot more one could say about etymology and historical linguistics. And I will, I'm going to have a video coming out hopefully very, fairly soon. Uh, that will. <laughs> yeah, don't say very yeah, soon. Yeah. That's uh, over promising. That is going to revisit a, a bit of this stuff. Stuff about, about dialects and, and dialects and, and that sort of thing. So I will maybe say more about it then. And I will no doubt come back to this topic again on the podcast too. But I think that sums up what still needed to be said after the previous video that I made. Okay. Well, I'm not, I don't want to talk too much about this, but I think, you know, what you're talking about is the development of what we might call scientific etymology or scholarly etymology. And I think that a lot of people who watch our videos in particular, you know, lots of people who are interested in etymology aren't necessarily aware of the principles by which historical linguistics functions. And why would they be? I mean, they're, as we've just listened to, quite complicated and difficult and need, you need a lot of work and time and understanding. So, I mean, you can go and look up a dictionary and find out what an etymology is, but if you want to try to do it yourself or to understand why a dictionary says what it does, that's hard. It's not just common sense. But people have been interested, as your video talks about, in the origins of words, you know, ever since, ever since presumably people started talking to other people who had other languages, which presumably was ever since ever, they've wondered why the words they use. And ever since we moved away from pure onomatopoeia <laughs> to, to arbitrary language, wondered why the words we use for things are the words we use for them, especially when you see that other people don't use the same word. And so I think the impulse for a lot of people who love etymology is to try to sort of look for those connections themselves. And unfortunately, it can be very misleading because you talked about, you know, sound changes. The most obvious thing to do when you look at words is look for other words that mean something similar that sound the same. But as you've just demonstrated with the sound changes with Grimm's Law and stuff, in fact, what you need to look for often is words that don't sound the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> two words that sound the same in two different languages might be less likely, depending on, you know, the history of those changes, might be less likely to be the same word. A word in Latin and a word in English that both start with a P are possibly, if there is an actual English word, 
less likely to be related than a word with P and a word with F. So if you follow the sort of what words sound the most similar, you're you're going to be misled. And also, we didn't talk very much at all about semantic changes. We talked a little bit, but... You know, I have another video that yeah, gets into that. Exactly. So, we can so, so we'll talk about it later. later but, but the basic point is, again, if you take two languages and you just look for words that mean the same thing and assume they must be related, words go through amazing changes in meaning over time. And the same root sounds can end up meaning something very different. But until all of this work was done in the 18th, 19th century, 20th century, the best tools people had were these two words sound the same or these two words mean something similar. And so you get this attempt to do. And, and so while that continues, I would say folk etymology continues now <laughs> unabated. And, yeah, and we no see in the comments slowly, to our really. videos that lots of people see spiritual and magical and religious and nationalistic meaning in etymology and therefore look for their own secret hidden understanding of the world through etymology and apply common sense rather than scientific principles to it to come up with whatever fits their best ideas. Well, that was happening a long time ago too. And you touched on Isidore of Seville who wrote that comprehensive etymological encyclopedia. And the reason those two things go together in his mind is because etymology is the study of true things and the origins of things. And so I just wanted to, to say a little bit more about who he was and what he did, because you only touched on it briefly in the video. So he's, we have very precise dates for him, which is quite, I guess, because he's a saint and right. he wrote so much. And so the dates are 560 to the 4th of April, 636. And it's important because that's his death day. Yeah, exactly. Of course, that doesn't mean it's correct. Yeah, but anyway, true. yeah. But it's the day that goes onto the calendar as yeah. his saint's day. Yeah. But, you know, even even having a precise year, frankly, is is pretty impressive at that period. And he's um, Seville. Obviously, he's from in, in Spain under the Visigothic kingdoms. And he wrote a whole bunch of things, not just the etymologia, mm -hmm. etymologiae, sorry. But that is his most famous work. A lot of the other stuff he wrote was theological, though not all of it. And the etymologia is really long and very comprehensive, or attempts to be very comprehensive. So I don't really want to talk about it in great length. But it does start off with talking about the seven liberal arts, the liberal mm -hmm. disciplines. Like it starts very, it starts with grammar and then it talks about those things. And I'm just, I thought I would read just the first paragraph. Mm -hmm. because I think it, it already gives you a very clear understanding of the way he's looking for it. Like, how do, where, where do words come from? So um, I'm going to read it. And of course, because he's all talking in Latin, I'm going to have to keep reading the Latin words out to explain. Right. I've got it in brackets. So on discipline and art. Discipline, disciplina, takes its name from learning, discera, whence it can also be called knowledge, scientia. Now, no, scira, to know, is named from learn, discera. Right. Because there's sounds that are the same, but because yep, yep. the meaning is the same. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing. Because none of us knows unless we have learned. Right. A discipline is so named in another way because the full thing is learned. Discitur plena, a discipline. <laughs> and an art, ars, genitive artis, is so called because it, it consists of strict, artus, precepts <laughs> and rules. Others say this word is derived by the Greeks and from the word arete, that is virtue, as they termed knowledge. So mm. arete, which means virtue. Plato and Aristotle would speak of this distinction between an art and a discipline. An art consists of matters that can turn out in different ways, while a discipline is concerned with things that have only one possible outcome. Thus, when something is expounded with true arguments, it will be a discipline. When something merely resembling the truth and based on opinion is treated, it is, will have the name of an art. I wonder what access he had to Greek authors. Well, at that point, he probably had a probably fair amount. Probably still, yeah. still did. I don't think so. But so you just, just to see there, like, you know, does discera and disciplina have anything to do with each other? I don't know. Scientia and scira do, sure, science and, and mm -hmm. to know, but scira and discera do not have anything no. to do with each other. So his etymologies, in other words, are not based on any scientific understanding, but it's very clear there from how he does it, what he's trying to do. He's looking for words that sound the same and that have a meaning or that that lead logically one from the other. And the reason he's doing it and the reason that would be good proof is because by talking about it like that, you learn something about what an art is. If the word comes from artus precepts, strict rules, then that tells you something about what art is. Mm -hmm. If it comes from arete virtue, then that tells you something about the value of art. So the etymology here, you know, <laughs> as far removed as possible in a way from this phonetic, you know, like, right. I don't care. 
All I care about is the phonetic simulate. Now, obviously, those phonetic patterns have to also fall into semantic groups. Yeah. You, you know, pater and father are connected because they also mean father. Mm -hmm. But the the but, but, but the the thing that matters the most is the phonology. Yeah. And and what's demonstrated again and again in the videos I do and everything is that very often it's really surprising mm -hmm. what the the proto word meant compared mm -hmm. to what the you know you can like you did for the sounds you might have to trace the steps mm -hmm. of how the meanings changed and sometimes you just have to say i don't know it has to have come from there because of the sounds and we have to assume that like it's close mm -hmm. enough in meaning that it must but there's a sen weird sense so, but that something happened, that happened then explain. we don't know why yeah. yeah but that would be i think nonsensical to isidore mm -hmm. like it just it would be a fundamental violation of how the world worked and he knows Greek and Latin, or he knows of Greek and Latin. So he's willing to believe that these things like follow logical precepts within those languages. And presumably, he's not necessarily saying that these explain the whole world, that only Greek and Latin work, but he's assuming there is a logical underpinning to the language mm -hmm. where words are going to have a relationship to one another that is going to mean something. So I just thought that was, it was just interesting to see that example. And people are still doing that, but it is not how scientific etymology goes. So his work is fascinating and interesting. And from time to time probably does give us real etymologies, especially when it's from like a name of a place to a thing or, you know, right. he preserves a historical moment or document or transition or event that we wouldn't know otherwise. But in general, we should not take him as being any kind of actual authority on etymology. The other thing I wanted to just mention is that he is in no way alone in the ancient world in being fascinated by these things. Right. It is something that is a feature of other scholars. I mean, we, we see it in other writers, but in particular, because it's now a podcast <laughs> without me mentioning Roman poetry, we see it a lot in, in Roman poets, Greek poets as well, but I'm, you know, I'm going to talk about the Roman ones. And what they do is they use what I suppose we could just call puns, mm -hmm. not necessarily in the same way, not necessarily to prove something about the world, but to sometimes just show off that they know stuff, but also as a way of adding variety and interest to their poetry. It's a stylistic. Feature. It's stylistic. But it can also do things like make allusions to other works. It can show off obscure knowledge. It can also point out a significance or a thematic element mm. within the story. So there's a million examples, but Ovid is very fond of etymological wordplay. He's fond of every single kind of wordplay that there could be. I was just looking sort of up for articles on these things. So just one example plucked somewhat at random in the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, which is the story that uh, it's metamorphoses. And it doesn't even matter what the story is, but there's a mulberry. At one point, somebody turns into a, his blood turns into a mulberry tree or there is a mulberry tree that is stained by his blood. And it's the story of lovers kept apart and come together. So he puns on the word mora, which means mulberry tree, mm -hmm. but also means it's a separate word that means delay. Mm -hmm. And the story of Pyramus and Thisbe is one of them right. is delayed. And so and it's, then, it's basically Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. The same and, plot. And it's this it's in um, Midsummer's Night Dream, too, as yeah. the little inset narrative in Shakespeare. But yeah, it's a very similar plot. But Mora is also an anagram of amor, love. Mm, right. So that's a kind of, I mean, it's not really etymology, but Isidore would use that as etymology. We saw that with his Discitur Plena, it can give us right. disc, Discipline. So Mora, you know, delay, mulberry tree, amor. And then Mora in Moriens, so dying. Mm -hmm. has that same mor root mos meaning death but also mors is a bite and of course the guy is mauled by a lion he's mm -hmm. bitten by a lion so you get lines and you know it's not really helpful to read this out in latin but you know lines where he has mor next to a mora an amor so he has all of these words in a cluster of four or five lines and the sounds are repeated but also there's the sort of a thematic idea mm -hmm. that there's a, a resonance between these words because they're in his mind related words whether or not they actually are. But then it can go further because so this, I'm going to read from an article here. This cluster of anagrammatic and paranomastic puns on mora, amor, mors, mora conceals another etymological wordplay of deeper significance on the Greek derivation of the word. The standard Greek term for mulberries was sukamina, but Athenaeus reports that the Alexandrian Greeks called them mora. Like the Alexandrians, wherever the Hellenistic Greek poet Nicander, who's Lost Transformations was an important model for Ovid, identifies the tree by the related form of morea rather than by the more common sukaminos. 
So now when he's using mora in Latin, he's referring to the specific Greek author who happened to use this dialectical word mm. for it. So etymological discussion of the Latin morus and morum preserved by Isidore shows that the Romans were aware of the Greek derivation of these words, that mora in Latin comes from the Greek. Athenaeus also preserves the information that a grammarian derived mora from haimoroa, flowing blood, in his etymology. Virgil clearly alludes to this etymology in his own poem, and in one reference he makes to the mulberry where he glosses the noun with an etymologically significant adjective, sanguineis moris, bloody mulberries. Hmm. So that's the kind of wordplay that, you know, again, pun is not quite the right word, but with Virgil, by saying sanguineis moris, Yes, a mulberry plant can be called bloody because it has red berries, mm -hmm. but he's showing that he knows that the Greek word, at least by some scholars, is said to come from a word for blood. So he's showing off his etymological knowledge, but not by using that word, by using a Latin word that refers to the Greek word that was the derivation of this Latin word, of the other Latin word, right? So it's that kind of thing. And he says Ovid follows Virgil by signaling the Greek etymology at the outset and conclusion of his tale with sanguinis arbor, the bloody tree. And then at the end of his tale, monumenta cruoris, a monument of remem remembrance of blood, mm. of a different word for blood. But although he suppresses the word, he glosses. So in both of those cases, he refers to the tree by reference to the being bloody in Latin without using the word mora, which is the word that is derived supposedly from the Greek word for blood. Right. So he replaces the word with an etymological gloss. So he's showing he knows it without actually using the, using the word. Yeah. yeah. So this is the kind of many layers of play and cross-linguistic play that these authors like to use. It's interesting hear, hearing these these specific examples. Mm -hmm. it, it sort of strikes my ear that they rely more on the consonants than the vowels. Well, I mean, I think that's not really too surprising given with the forms of Latin and Greek where the vowels are very shiftable, right? Yeah. Because they can shift with and so I wonder forms if, if, of language, of words, yeah. So I wonder if you would, you know, find different kinds of puns mm -hmm. in languages that were more vowel where the vowel, where vowels were more stable and the yeah, consonants like are what Semitic changed. Like Semitic languages yeah. or, but the, yeah, and in a vowel Yeah, language. there must be languages where the vowels would be yeah. more of a difference. Yeah. Oh, exactly. I'm sure you get different structures mm. to that. In fact, another article I was looking at points out that very often it's alliteration or the initial consonants, in fact, that seem to be the most important. So if they alliterate, right. then they'll right. then they'll think they're connected and the rest of the word is just kind of, if it follows a vaguely similar pattern, it's close enough. Mm -hmm. Whereas if the beginnings of the words don't match, they're much less likely to think that they're the same word. Mm. Now, Latin accent is recessive, so that might be part of it too. The accented syllable may feel more important for reasons like that. But there are sort of rules. So I'm not going to go over them, but there's an article here that I have that I can put a link to that kind of lists the types of etymological connections that the poets and these authors tend to make. Like right. A is from B, A is similar to B, therefore A is from B, you know, like kind mm -hmm. of works out the different, the different levels of complexity that these kinds of assumptions about language can take. And they're fun, but what's important again in these poems is they don't necessarily reflect any actual truth about the language, right. but they reflect a listener's experience of the language or semantic connections or very often other people's suppositions or other authors' mm -hmm. suppositions in the past about such things. What Virgil likes to do a lot in the Aeneid and elsewhere is have in lines that are very close to each other, different forms of words where one is the etymological, seemingly the etymological root of the other. So Saturnia, Saturn, mm -hmm. he has a line in the Aeneid where he talks about Saturnia and Juno. And then two lines later, it has the line that has the word Saturata, saturated, filled up. Mm -hmm. in it. There's nothing explicit in the line that connects those two words. It's the simple proximity within the same grammatical structure, like larger phrase, and within a couple of lines. Mm -hmm. That proximity and the fact that Saturnian was thought to come from the same root as filled up, and therefore he puts the two words in close proximity to show that connection, to emphasize that connection as being part of where that word comes from. But it's, he's not saying it. Like there's nothing right. explicit in the lines that is making that connection or elsewhere he has, you know, a few, a, a hundred lines later, he talks about saturabile, overfilled, and then has, when he's talking about Juno still, 
but he, now he doesn't call her Saturnian, but he has this other word for her that has to do with saturation. And then later talks about she's filled up satis est. There is enough of hatred for her. Right. Right. So words to do with satiation or fullness or plenitude gather around Juno. And in one place, her actual epithet of Saturnian, because she's the daughter of Saturn, that's mm. why she's called Saturnian. In one place, that epithet is used. And then elsewhere, that epithet isn't there. But there's these words that have that etymological connection that cluster around her because they are appropriate to her, even if they actually technically refer to some other thing in the line, you know, referencing something else. So he'll do that. That's the sort of thing he'll do repeatedly. And you can actually go through the Aeneid and find like a root will be repeated multiple times around particular characters or particular events or something like that repeatedly throughout the Aeneid. So that's another kind of, you know, puns isn't really the right word for it, but hmm. there's playing with these etymological connections. And that's really all I wanted to point out because I think it's interesting. Well, and I think, you know, Latin students ever since have been fascinated and aware of this kind of wordplay. And I have one example of that just kind of shows this appreciation for Latin punning. Mm -hmm. And it takes us back to the world of colonial British India. Mm -hmm. There was a, a general, Sir Charles Napier, who was basically the, the military commander in chief in India mm -hmm. in the 18th century. And he sometimes clashed with the East India Company, mm -hmm. so they didn't always agree on what the right way to, to govern and handle the situations, what was the best way to go. How, how best to exploit the natives, yes. Exactly. <laughs> and in fact, there is a specific extra connection between Napier and William Jones, the linguistic whiz kid who came up with the idea of Proto-Indo-European, mm -hmm. both Napier and Jones specifically reacted against the practice of the sati, the immolation of widows when their husbands died. And this is in the context of, for instance, Jones trying to reconcile local customs and laws with British customs right. and laws right. and the difficulty of that. And Napier said at one point, be it so, this burning of widows is your custom. Prepare the funeral pile. But my nation has also a custom. When men burn women alive, we hang them and confiscate their property. My carpenters shall therefore erect gibbets on which to hang all concerned when the widow is consumed. Let us all act according to our national customs." Mm -hmm. And apparently right. the practice, the uh, they took the point. And, but that's kind of beside the point of this particular pun. When he annexed an area in what is now Pakistan, and he apparently did it without full authority to do so, <laughs> but he was successful. So it was kind of all right in the end. Well, all right. Yes. <laughs> the area, which is called Sindh, S-I-N-D-H, and so there's one of those aspirated Ds mm -hmm, for you, mm -hmm. Sindh. That we can't pronounce properly, yeah. yeah. He is meant to have sent back a report saying, Pekawi. I have sinned. Yeah, sinned as an S-I-N-N-E-D. <laughs> but he had also sinned by doing it without I asking have, for permission. Yes, yes, he's, he's right. done it without permission. So he, he has also, actually he sinned. has sinned. He has place sinned, sinned. Yeah. yes. So yeah. a pun on the words has as well. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is uh, apocryphal. It's apocryphal. always apocryphal. They're always apocryphal when they're good. <laughs> so it was it, the joke was actually written by, and they've been able to track down who did come up with it. It's a woman named Catherine Winkworth who later went on to write hymns. She was 16 at the time, though, that she came up with this, and she sent it into Puck magazine, right. <laughs> and they printed it as if it were uh, right. an actual report. But it was, it was so it was all just a joke. So in the end, it turned out that it wasn't actually Napier who punned it. Oh, okay. I am going to hit you. <laughs> you told me I was going to hit you when you told that. Who was a pundit? Who pundit? <laughs> That's commitment to a bit. I told that whole story about a pun just as a setup for my own pun. So thanks for listening, everyone. I think we're done here. <laughs> Those pundits, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You made it. You don't need to keep talking about it. <laughs> we're done. One last little tidbit, speaking of Isidore, mm -hmm. one other kind of interesting thing that came out of a little just kind of detail that came out of Isidore's etymologii was what are referred to as TO maps. This is how maps were kind of visualized in the Middle Ages. In Christian Europe. In Christian Europe. As if, if you think of a, a circle, 
an O with a T written through it. So like one line that goes through the middle mm -hmm. horizontally, and then a sort of half line from the bottom to, to, to that the intersection point. Line, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it looks like a T inside an O and uh, you have Asia is actually on the top. So they didn't have North as their uh, as up, up yeah. in, in medieval maps. It's always East is up. And so you have Asia and then you have the two sections below are Africa and Europe. Right. And they thought of the world in terms of these three kind of regions. Mm -hmm. And the TL map is based on Isidore's description of the world in the Etymologiae. So that is the source of that. And so if you ever look at medieval maps, that's mm -hmm. what you'll see. And I didn't, you know, talk about that in the video, but I did use the image of TO maps, particularly in, if you watch the video, it's the background. Right. It's a TO map. And it's a sort of an Easter egg, I guess, because you didn't yeah. explain it didn't at all. explain it the... at all, but you know, it's Isidore. But you know, as I said, Isidore's book is really an encyclopedic work. So mm -hmm. obviously it's going to have, you know. Things like geography. Geography. And stuff, yeah. Yeah. And speaking of encyclopedias, and I don't really have anything specific to say about this, but I just wanted to bring it up as a topic of conversation, not just for, for us, but for, you know, any listeners, but it just occurred to me when thinking of, you know, that linkages model of dialects with these, mm -hmm. you know, complex networks, it's similar to, you know, the complex interconnections that you see in encyclopedias, particularly if you think of something like Wikipedia, yeah. right? Which has these references to other Wikipedia entries. And mm -hmm. so it forms this complicated network of things. And one of the tools that I use, is really just a, a different front end for Wikipedia. It's called WikiWeb and it's an app, iOS app. Mm -hmm. And it, it just allows you to, to look up Wikipedia pages, but when you click on a link in one entry, it will track the path you took from the previous article. Mm -hmm. So it will show the interconnection between those two articles. And then if you keep clicking, you end up building this complicated network of mm -hmm. how all of these different Wikipedia articles are connected. Oh, so it's a good way of tracking your research if you're looking for interconnections between concepts. Right. So it's one thing that I use. There is also something called the six degrees of Wikipedia, which looks for the connection between any two right. random Finds Wikipedia articles. Right. the shortest articles. path between two. Yes. Two. Right. Which is actually usually not the most useful thing because the shortest path between two things is not necessarily the most interesting well, path. Well, there's some fairly basic things that probably turn up in almost every Wikipedia. Yeah, you know, which are so many Wikipedia articles that just really isn't going to tell you very much. Yeah. yeah. But every now and then, you know, I we'll check it. And every now and then I come up with something surprising. Right. If I think of two things that I think are not at all related and I put them in there and sometimes it will come up with an interesting path between them. Hmm. But you know, it's just a fun thing to play around yeah, no, with. Sounds interesting. Yeah. And when I made this video originally, this was around the time that, and I've mentioned James Burke before, but you know, he's, <laughs> only once. I haven't, twice I haven't mentioned him recently. Uh-huh. But it was around this time that there was a Kickstarter to create a sort of James Burke connections app. Oh yeah. That was, there were various different plans. One was just, it was going to be again, a front end for Wikipedia mm -hmm. to show the connections between things. But there was also, you know, he'd been working on this thing called the knowledge web, which again, is, it was going to be this graphical connections between yeah. various things. And there was a sort of model of it that had been a limited model of it that had been created and it's still online, but to show, show this off, as far as I know, all Never of this really went nowhere, which is a shame because I think it's really interesting, but that model of the knowledge web was done on a software called the brain, which is the same software that I used to mm -hmm. track my research. And now I have built up this, basically what it is, is it's a, an etymological dictionary grafted onto an encyclopedia. Right, right. So Isidore would be proud. <laughs> so there are words. Proud, but so confused. Yes. <laughs> so confused. <laughs> so there are words in it and the etymologies are all traced, you know, back to whatever from the English word to whatever, mm -hmm. wherever it came from. But then those English words also point to concepts. So like a historical event or a, a historical figure mm -hmm. or an abstract idea mm -hmm. or whatever. 
And so it, it's sort of like a Wikipedia-like encyclopedia of things, but attached to an etymological dictionary. And so you can find these, that's how I find these loops. And that's mm -hmm. how I sort of track all of these loops is mm -hmm. by putting them into the brain. And it's gotten to the size that now I can use it to find things. Mm -hmm. Because you put something, every time you're doing research, you, this is where you store the research. Yeah. And you so store, I put all the notes yeah. and, mm -hmm. and links and everything in, mm -hmm. and then I can search it and find something that I didn't know was there. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of already containing more stuff than I can kind of keep in my head. It's your brain. Yeah. And when it becomes self-aware, it will be the nerdiest machine that takes <laughs> over the world. <laughs> exactly. But I've often thought that it would be really neat to kind of make something like this available to people. To make your brain. To make my brain available to people. But it would involve a bit more manpower than I have mm -hmm. available to me to put into the thing. Yeah. So what we need is minions. <laughs> so many minions. <laughs> because, you know, if you could produce a, a publicly publishable version of this mm -hmm. thing, people could go, and explore. Go, in, go inside my brain and explore around. <laughs> And all they'd find would be pundits. <laughs> well, in the end, it turns out I pund it. Oh, God. All right. Is this it? <laughs> Are we done? <laughs> so, if, yeah, if anyone, you know, has hours and hours of their life they'd like to devote to a completely just for the fun of it project and would like to do that <laughs> for us, that'd be great. Get in touch. But in the meantime, <laughs> you'll just use it for your research. Yes. And people can, the brain is an existing, you can. Yeah, think, you can you get can, the software. There's a free version of it. So you can build your own brain. It's just thebrain.com. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Thebrain.com. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, great. build your own brains. Build your own brain. Mm. All right. Well, thank you for listening <laughs> to this very, very etymological episode of The Endless Knot. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.